And all God's people said, my, 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 that was some good, good singing. We appreciate them. Give them another hand. Let them know that you love them and you thank God for them. It is an absolute joy and a privilege to get to be here at the Mims Baptist Church. I have heard of you before. Uh, I was in a meeting with Mark Trammell. And uh, I got to preaching, I think, I don't remember, when I got to preaching in a big way, he said, you need to go to Mims Baptist Church. <laughs> and then my friend, Dr. Jerry Chaddick, got the call to come all the way over here to Texas. And I thought, now I may get a chance to go to the Mims Baptist Church. <laughs> And uh, what an absolute privilege it is to get to be here. I thank God you ought to be good to your preacher. You ought to love your preacher. I believe God has sent you one of the finest men of God in this entire nation. And you ought to be thankful for the man of God that he has sent you. Buy him a new car. Give him a raise. Amen. Come on, somebody. And it's an absolute privilege to get to be here. Good to travel today with uh, Brother Vaughn Ramsey. He is the chairman of the board of directors for CT Towns Evangelistic Ministries. And we appreciate him running up and down the roads with us. And for this quick night, flew here this morning and fly back today. And uh, what an absolute privilege it is to be here. The choir was wonderful. The singing was tremendous. And uh, it's just my joy to get to be here. I... Once I get in a preaching gear, I don't know how to come back out of it, so I'm going to say something before I get started, and that is right out those doors to the left, uh, there's a little table that they have set up there with some of the stuff out there. I wish my wife uh, could have been here with me. Well, we've got three little redneck children at the house, and Delta can't handle my youngins, and so... Uh, she couldn't be here. We sing together, and, and she writes sermons, and I preach them. Amen. And uh, we, we've we done this for 12 or 13 years. I feel handicapped without her. I, I, I just, not all of me is here. But I wish you could hear her sing. She's got such a gift and anointing. We sing together. And out those out there on that table, there's three or four different CDs that the office shipped up here. And then uh, there's this book that the preacher talked about called the Burlington Revival. We wrote this book for one reason, and that is because I believe with all of my heart that the only answer to the problems that we are facing in America is not a Democrat or a Republican. It's not money. It's not this or that. I believe the need of America in this day and hour is old-time Holy Ghost revival from coast to coast that will shake us by the power of God. And uh, in Burlington, North Carolina, it was a normal meeting. It's what I do every week of my life. I go from one city to the next. It was a three-day meeting. Uh, maybe 200 people the first week, and we went on through Friday night, and there was probably 250 people. It was an unusual move of God. It wasn't people getting saved yet. It wasn't a loud, boisterous meeting. It was inside the house of God that judgment began to come to the house of God. How many of y'all know some people sit on this side of the church because somebody else sits on that side of the church? <laughs> and boy, I got, I got to preaching the Word of God about how God's concerned of not just how we are this way, but how we are this way. And getting our hearts right and getting our lives clean. And I watched the Holy Ghost get the broom out and go to cleaning things out in that church. I watched people under the power of the Holy Ghost get up out of their seat over there and go to somebody they had a grudge with for years and go make things right. I seen people grab the preacher and say, preacher, I've been upset about this and that and I've been talking about you and I want you to know I'm saying. And the Holy Ghost just started cleaning things in that church. Friday night, that preacher got up, Brother Hobbs, and uh, I won't tell you the whole book because I want you to get it on the way out. But he got up and said, I don't think the Lord's done. I was scheduled to be in Chattanooga the next night. I, I said, well, I got to go to Chattanooga. And I tossed and turned all night long and the Holy Ghost made it clear to me that I was not to go to Chattanooga. I got up the next morning, went in the preacher's office and he was in there praying that God wouldn't let me leave. And I went in there and said, preacher, the Lord wants me to stay here. 
And I said, okay, we got on the Facebook, got on the phone tree and called everybody. What well, was 250 people that Friday night, by Monday night the second week, there was five or 600 people in that auditorium. And it just went on and went on to the beginning of the third week when it went on, there was over a thousand people in that building. We were cramming people in every broom closet, every Sunday school room that we could. And we was afraid the fire marshal was gonna shut us down. And uh, so we called my, one of my mentors, Dr. Ralph Sexton Jr. from Asheville, North Carolina, sent in a large tent and I, I did not want to do it. I thought we are talking about Baptist people. If the thermostat ain't just right, they won't even come to church. More or less going to, come on, some of y'all know I'm talking to you. So we, we, you. You wouldn't even come in if the thermostat's not right. And we put up that tent, put up 1,500 chairs, thinking in our wildest imaginations, we'll never fill that tent up. And that night, it shut the entire interstate down. The police had to come direct traffic as over 2,800 people came the first night we did that tent. It went that way under that tent for three solid months. Thousands of people got saved. Politicians, local leaders, other churches. I mean, I had Presbyterian pastors, I had Nazarene pastors, Baptist pastors. They didn't sit together, but they, they was all there in different places. And uh, I mean, that whole town just got electrified by the power of God. And I, I, I messed up, y'all. I got, I got to tell you, you're going, I messed up because I can't be satisfied with normal. Once you've experienced the real thing, dead, dry church will not satisfy the longing of the inside of your heart. And I wrote this book for one reason, and that is so that America could get over normal church. The, 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 the devil has allowed us to get in this rut and we're just complacent with it. As long as we sing two or three songs and somebody gives a testimony and a preacher says something, as long as it don't step on your toes, you'll leave and put your tithe in the offering plate. But what if I told you there was more to it than just that? What if I told you, come on now, what if I told you that America can still have the power of God and the presence of God in this day that can save your sons and save your daughters and save your grandbabies and turn your schools upside down and the blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. If my people which are called by my name would humble themselves and pray America needs revival. So that book's out there and uh, I hope you'll stop by and get it. Daniel chapter number three, Daniel chapter number three, verse number 16. When you get there, I'd invite you to stand to your feet uh, all over the auditorium. My brother got up and said that he had left at three o'clock in the morning from Boston. And that's, I, I Googled it instantly. I thought I was interested in that. I thought, how did you drive from Boston to Houston? But you obviously had flu because that's a day and a half drive. But we're glad to have them here. How many of y'all glad they come and sang for us tonight? They were such a blessing. Such a blessing. And uh, I have heard of them and listened to them, but this is my first time getting to go to church with them, and I hope it's not my last. And uh, what an absolute joy it is to be in God's house. Daniel chapter number 3 and verse number 16 you Bible readers know where we're at. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar has made a decree that when the music goes to play and everybody's to bow their knee to the false idol. But there's three Hebrew boys named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that would not bow their knee. You Bible readers know where it puts them at. They thrown into the fiery furnace and we have great, great inspiration and truth that we can glean from. And uh, I have been praying on this and studying on this all day long. We're liable to be out by midnight, so say amen right there. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so our God, whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. I like verse 18. But if not, 
That's a different level of faith right there, isn't it? But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded, and that they that should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, I don't know why they were wearing hose, but we'll move on, and their hats and their other garments and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? <laughs> they answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Somebody put your hands together and give God praise for the Word of God tonight. Father, help us as we preach. I didn't fly all this way and travel all this way just to fill space. I pray, God, you'd anoint me, fill me, give me the unction that the old timers prayed for. God, fill this place with thy presence and with your unction. Save that one that needs to be saved. Restore that one that needs to be restored. And God, encourage that one that needs to be encouraged. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. amen. Number one tonight, looking at our text, I want us to see the commitment that steered them. The commitment that steered them. The, pl the music, if you can use your imagination, begins to play and the entirety of that nation and all of those that are under the rule of Nebuchadnezzar, without doubt, without talking, without any thoughts whatsoever, they bow their knee and begin to worship this false idol that Nebuchadnezzar has set up. But off in the distance, everybody looks around and there are three old boys that are Hebrew boys uh, that are closely tied and they've had a faith of the Jewish people and while everybody else bowed their knees, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would not bow their knee. Everybody else around them is bowing. They know that they could get in trouble with the king for not obeying the decree of the king. But yet, for some reason, they would not bow their knee. Ladies and gentlemen, I come to tell you that it was a commitment that steered them. You study the life of these three Hebrew boys, and, and much like the lion's den, uh, the, 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 all they had come from this other world, they weren't raised in the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar. They were raised in a place where they were taught to, to worship the one true God, and that they were not to bow and worship anything else other than the one true God. And so I noticed this, that their commitment was not made the day that they were told to bow their knee to the false idol. Their commitment was made long ago when they were children and raised in the admonition of the Lord and there was a daddy that taught them right and there was a mama that taught them right and all the way from their childhood they were taught that there is one God and he is Jehovah God and we don't worship anybody but Jehovah God and finally when they get in the heat of the moment there's no decision to be made. The decision was already made years ago. The reason some of y'all falter in the midst of the fire is because you wait for the fire to get there before you'll make a decision. But aren't you glad that we can make a commitment to the Lord in this day and hour and that commitment will steer us through days of adversity. We're living in a day a limp wristed generation. 
My daddy would call it a lacy generation. Anybody know what that means? I'm talking about a flimsy generation. As long as everybody's patting me on the back, I'll serve God. As long as people are cheering me on, I'll serve God. But let somebody say something bad about you or somebody doesn't recognize you or you don't get the accolades that you think you deserve and boy, you'll hit the door and go find another church down the road. Listen to me. We've got to get back to living at a level of commitment in this day and hour. This thing is going to wax worse and worse and worse and those that are born again, true believers must stand up with the commitment that will say with the heart I did not get in this for a man I did not get in this for accolades I did not get in this for the worship of people but I got in this because there was a day in my life when I was so lost and headed for hell and the God of heaven reached further down than I could reach up he saved my soul changed my life I'm not doing this to be churchy I'm doing this because God saved me hey I'm not working to get saved. I'm working because I am saved. I don't have to serve God. I get to serve God. Where are the people that are committed in this day and hour? Not some of y'all okay? Not everybody is committed. I go to churches all the time that don't know nothing about commitment. A year or two ago, I had an assignment to go to a little country town up in the mountains of Virginia to preach two or three nights. I was headed out to leave and my little boy Tucker, he said, Daddy, can I go with you? I said, get in a truck. He got in a truck with me, put his headphones on, turned the Minion movie on, and he just zones out in the Minion world <laughs> driving down the road. We got up there, drove two or three hours, got to that church, and when I got there, there was probably 40 people max in that little country church, and they were spread out. I think they were people. They were either people or I was in a wax museum. I still am not sure where I was. I got up. I preached the same way to five people, the same way I do to 5,000 people. I don't come and fly and say, I wonder how I'm going to use my voice tonight. I got one gear. This is just how it comes out. If you don't like it, I'm sorry. There'll be somebody else here next Monday. This is just how it happens. I get up and it just this way it comes out. I got up in that little old country church and I reared that little West Virginia finger and I was rearing that thing back preaching to them people. I was, this Shamu section, I was spitting on all of them, you know giving it everything I got and the whole time I'd preach they <laughs> the only two moves they made was like this and every now and then they'd go some of y'all got that disease you know, us preachers, we got our little lingos. You know, when we get in a crowd, we, you know, our little, our little things that we try to use to get a response out of people. You know, I got my funny little story I'll tell. And my funny story, they didn't even laugh. I told my little liner, he's the lily of the valley. He's the bright morning star. He's the sweet rose of Sharon. He's the great... And I just stopped halfway in because they wasn't getting with it. <laughs> My little boy Tucker has been traveling with me since he was two and a half weeks old. He started looking around. He realized something ain't right in this place at all. <laughs> He's sitting on the front row. I'm up there, red face, sweat pouring down. I'm giving it everything I got. And Tucker starts looking around. <laughs> No joke. Starts looking around. Finally, he realized daddy's in trouble tonight. <laughs> daddy's in trouble tonight. No joke. He stands up on the front pew and goes, good preaching, daddy. Amen. <laughs> Got down and went like this. <laughs> A 
That crowd was not a committed crowd. You have to learn not to set your temperature gauge based on a crowd that is not committed. Sometimes when we gauge how committed we are against each other, we have a false measuring stick to measure it against. You ought to, you ought to get to as close to God as you possibly can and let your measuring stick be God and get as close to God and say, God, if, if everybody else bows their knees and nobody else comes to church to worship and if everybody else wants to go through the routine and if everybody else wants to be satisfied with just mundane Christianity and going through the motions, they can be satisfied if they want, but I, I just can't settle. I just can't be satisfied with dead, dry religion. If everybody bows their knee, I'll stand for the cause of Christ and be committed in this day and hour. The commitment that steered them. Number two, the Christ that settled them or secured them. The Christ that secured them. They are taken away from the crowd, brought before King Nebuchadnezzar, and they said, we are not careful to answer the old king. Said our God is able. Boy, I love that. Our God is able and he will deliver us. Then they said this, they got a little further in their faith and they said, but if not, we will not bow our knee. Let me ask you a question. Do you have that kind of faith? You got that, but if not kind of faith? Their faith, you know, this kind of kicks that prosperity, health and wealth junk out the window, don't it right here? They stand for Christ. They don't get a Rolls Royce or Mercedes Benz. They get bound up, ushered to the burning, fiery furnace, and they're about to get their death sentence in the fiery furnace. The Bible said that Nebuchadnezzar was so full of fury that he told him to heat the furnace up seven times and it's so hot that the men that are assigned to throw them in the fire and throw them in the furnace that the fire comes out and consumes the strongest men in the kingdom that are assigned to throw them in the fire. And they go to throw these bound three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace. It is a death sentence. As far as the king, as far as King Nebuchadnezzar is concerned, this is the end of them. We'll never see them again. This is over. But Nebuchadnezzar made a mistake. Yeah, Nebuchadnezzar messed up bad. I mean, if he could go back and have a reset button, he'd have done a much different. Watch this. If Nebuchadnezzar was smart, he'd have thrown them in one by one. He'd have threw one in, let them burned up, then thrown another one in, let them burned up, and then thrown another one and let them burned up. You say, why? Because when he threw them all three together bound in, he evoked the promise of the word of God that if two or three are gathered in my name, there I'll be in the midst. And when those three Hebrew boys were thrown into the fire, who shows up? There's one. Oh, King Nebuchadnezzar said, did not we cast three into the fire? They said, yes, O oh, king. He said, then why are there four? And I feel like preaching. I, there are four in the fire, and the fourth appears to be like the Son of God. Ladies and gentlemen, what a joy to know being saved may not exempt me from the fire. Being saved may not exempt me from the trial. But I'm glad that, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Amen. And there he is in the midst of the fire. Jesus is there. I've preached this many different ways. You know, all of us recognize that the fourth man's in the fire with them. But nowhere does it say that they recognize that the fourth man is with them. You know, sometimes you can be in the middle of a fire and feel like God has forsaken you and feel like God has forgotten you and feel like God has walked away from you and everybody else sees the grace of God all over you. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. Yes, sir. 
It's not based on how you feel. It's based upon the truth of the word of God. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. He's with you. He was with me when I got on the airplane in Augusta this morning. He was with me when I missed my flight to come to Houston in Atlanta this morning. But while I was in Atlanta uh, losing my attitude over missing that flight, he was back with my children all at the same time. He was still in Augusta, still in Atlanta. He was here waiting on me when I got here to Houston. He's everywhere all at the same time. And no matter what you go through this week, next week, or next month, you have a God that will be there with you. It is the Christ that settles us. It is the Christ that that said, all people wonder all the time, how can the people of God walk through adversity? How can the people of God walk through the fires and the trials of life and fight cancer and disease and devastation? Have you seen it before? Have you seen the people of God go through those things only for them to come to church and they still lift their hands in praise and the devil would like to knock them out, but they just keep on lifting that hand? That's the grace of God that testifies that he's hallelujah that he's still there with you and I. I'm thankful tonight that I serve a God that does not abandon me when things get hard. He does not walk out on me when everybody else walks out, but he's with us on the mountain and he's with us in the valley. Somebody at Mims ought to help me praise the Lord that he's a God that is with us. The commitment that steered them. They made up their mind years ago. It was easy for them to make that decision because the decision was already made. Number two, there was a Christ that settled them in the midst of the fire. They were not there alone and you're not by yourself alone either. Amen. 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 Then lastly, and I'm done, there was a consideration that secured them. A consideration that, cons that, that secured them. There's a part of this text that I had never seen before until just recently. I was preaching this way down in Waycross, Georgia, and while, you've had this happen before, while I was preaching, God revealed it to me. I like to tore walls out that <laughs> night. <laughs> Fourth man's in the fire with them. They were bound together and they were thrown down. How many of y'all believe we got a God that can take what the devil means for bad and mean it for good? Amen. Explain this one to me, other than it being a God thing. The ropes that bound them burn off. But their clothes weren't singed at all. Amen. Sometimes the devil smiles when you walk in a fire, but God is using the fire to get off of you what the devil put on you. Yes, sir. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. The devil thinks it's to be your end and be the, the end of it all. But God will let you walk through that fire. What he wants to stay will stay. And what the devil put on you will burn off. The bondage is off of them. They were down. But now when we look and Nebuchadnezzar looks and he sees inside the fiery furnace, he said, Where did we not cast three? They said, yes. He said, then why are there four? And the fourth appears, appears to be like the son of God. And they are loosed. Amen. And... <laughs> What you doing walking around in a fire, Jack? I mean, come on. I seen that while I'm preaching. They just walking around. They probably got a little strut to them walking down. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. You thought you going to kill us. No, nah, Nebuchadnezzar. You going to do better than that dog. No, 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 no. They walking around. Some of y'all just need to keep on walking. The devil done told you you ain't going to make it, and you thought it was going to be the end. But what does it do to the devil when he thought that he cut your legs out from under you, and you just keep on walking. You just keep on serving God, keep on going to church, and you walk in my my question is, in the middle of my sermon in Waycross, Georgia, if they can walk, why ain't they walking out? <laughs> my logic is, you throw me in a fire and I have the ability to walk and the fire that I'm in is not burning me, I'm going to trust it in that moment, but I want to get out as fast as possible. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Why are they not climbing out? 
Your Bible paints a picture of a calm. They just walking around. <laughs> walking in the midst of the fire. That's my title tonight. How to walk in the midst of the fire. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. If you can walk, why would you not try to walk out? I've always preached this. That everybody else can see the fourth man but you. I don't believe that anymore. The only reason I can possibly imagine of why they can walk but would not try to walk out. Some of y'all getting ahead of me. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, hurry, get out. We'll be out in a little bit. We'd rather stay in here with him than be out of the fire without him. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know how to explain it. I hope I don't go through a fire tomorrow. I hope I don't have to go through a trial tomorrow. But there's something about walking through the fires of this life. You get to see him in a way that you don't get to see him at any other time. You get to see him as a providing Savior and a radical Savior and a loving Savior that when nobody else can get to where you are, he's in the middle of the fire with you tonight. Yes. We'll be with him a little bit. We, we'd rather stay in the fire with him. If I'd have known I was going to have this good a time, I'd have booked a whole week over here. I'm going to get that whole crowd saved up here tonight. That whole crowd going to get saved. That's the center section, that whole thing right there. <laughs> By tomorrow night, y'all can come down here with the rest of the fun. <laughs> Imagine what it was like when they're thrown into the fire. And I mean, just use your imagination. These are real people. This ain't a fairy tale. They're thrown into the fire, maybe thinking this is it. What's bound them has now been loosed. Yeah. Their clothes are not on fire. The flames are not touching them. Their clothes don't even smell like smoke. Shadrach looks at Meshach and Meshach looks at Abednego and says, what's going on? Shadrach says, I, I, think, I, 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 I think I know. And on the other side of the fire, there he is. Jesus is in the fire. Victory comes in the life of a Christian when you get your eyes off the fire and you find Jesus in the fire with you. We stay defeated because all we do is focus on the fire. And we focus on the pain and we got this little thing we do to God. God, why? God, don't you love me? God, why would you let me do this? And God's tonight telling some people, shh, quit looking at the fire. Quit looking at the furnace. Because somewhere in the fire, you'll find him. And when you find him, the fire will not sting you. The smoke will not get on you. And you're going to walk out of what the devil thought was going to kill you. Amen. Can you play something pretty on that piano for me? And come on with her. You think about something to sing as imitation. Y'all got to earn your money tonight. Come on. I don't ever get to worship with them. I want to hear them sing some more. Just something soft and slow. I uh, married my wife. Uh, went to seminary in, in Augusta, left West Virginia when God called me to preach. And I recognized very quickly that I was not smart enough to pass the Greek and the Hebrew and homiletics and the exegesis of the proper dividing of the Word of God. So I fell in love with the dean's daughter and I married the dean's daughter. 
You can't fail your son-in-law. God blessed us. Me and Becky started off in ministry. I was working as a, an assistant to the pastor. Becky's mother was the church secretary. Becky's daddy was the assistant pastor. The whole family reeks of ministry and singing. Becky's mama could get up and sing the glory of God down. Our whole family, all we knew, my, my side of the family, her side of the family, everybody was in ministry. I'm ashamed to say it, but I had a false philosophy in those days. I believe that as long as I'm serving God, living for God, tithing, doing my best to please God, then it's as if there is this shield around me that keeps me from bad things happening to me. How many of you know that that is not in your Bible? Job said, man born of, man born of a woman is few of days and full of trouble. We was going about our lives and me and Becky had been married about a year or two and everything is wonderful. We just built this new, massive, large six million dollar auditorium, the very church that God's let me pastor now. It was we had just built it, everything's wonderful, the choir's full, there's twenty five hundred people in this auditorium every single week, the power of God's we're at full steam as a family. One day, Becky's mama started coughing. And uh, they took her to the doctor. They said she got a lung disease. She wouldn't get no better. A day or two later, they did a scan. They said, well, she got this or that. And I'll never forget when Becky's daddy called me and Becky and said, put on speaker, I need to talk to you. And they said, they have today diagnosed your mother with cancer. They said they're going to put a port in and they're going to start this and do that. And some of you have been through that when you've heard that C word and how many have learned by now that one phone call can change everything boy we wept and cried and we prayed and called everybody that we knew how to pray and asked God to heal her and touch her they sent her home said next week we'll start therapy and start chemo and all these things and two weeks from the day they diagnosed her with cancer Carol collapsed in her own house and died in her home my little old wife went from being the blue eyed blonde headed joy of the whole church to a darkness came over her we buried her mama and walked through that trial and walked we were in a fire we begin to live through all that and go through all that and all the depression and anxiety and the struggle that goes along with all of that. We'd go to church and Becky would hang her head. She's like, I don't even feel like going. They'd say, Becky, can you sing such and such song? And she'd say, no, I, I can't sing it. I'd say, baby, why don't you sing it? She'd say, because I, I don't even know if I believe it. She said, how could God take my mama how could God, we're all serving him, how could God let these things happen to us? And before you judge my wife, you might ought to walk in her shoes for her. As a husband, I thought, I've got to learn, I've got to say something that'll help her snap out of this. I realized I don't have any words. Some things are so deep and dark that there are no words that you can say. I thought, well, I'll take her to some big highfalutin conference and some big theological person will get up and say something that'll unlock this grief and help her climb out. And we went, but it didn't help her. Took her to the doctor and they gave her as much medicine as she could take. And I just numbed it went on for a year or two this darkness in my home I remember we thought to ourselves well we'll have a baby and if she has a baby it'll take her mind off of that <laughs> how many know that ain't true she couldn't get pregnant that added to all of it and lost her mama now she can't get pregnant all these different things are going on and Becky kept going deeper and deeper and deeper and the deeper she went into that depression the louder the devil got and said I got you CT this is how it ends I got your wife she's never gonna come out of this 
I won't go into it, but I was scared to leave her by herself. And I thought, this is it. I had just started dabbling in evangelism, traveling some, and I, I was going to North Carolina that night to preach as a about a three or four hour drive and I wouldn't stay I'd go preach driving I'd come back home and I was going that day and Be Becky's daddy called me he has since by that time remarried and moved to another state pastoring another church he married Miss Brenda Roop of the Roop family that traveled and sang for years under his wings and all of that and they were in another town serving God and Steve had called me he said I he said, I woke up this morning with a Bible verse on my heart, and I believe God put it on my heart for Becky. He said, I'm going to come to the house and see you. I said, well, I'm going to preach. And I said, but Becky would love to see you. And I got in the truck, and I left and went to go preach, and uh, Steve came to the house. I went and preached, drove all the way home. I got home maybe 2 o'clock in the morning. I had really forgotten that Steve was even supposed to come see Becky. I walked in the house. Becky's got me trained not to wake her up. I took my shoes off very quietly at the door, and I began to slip in the room, and I was going to get in bed very quietly not to wake her. I turned the corner of that little house we were living in at the time, expecting to walk into a dark bedroom, only to find at 2 or 2.30 in the morning, the lamp is turned on beside the bed. She is uh, seated up in the bed with a Bible on her lap and 10 million snot rags all over the bed. I said, baby, what you doing awake? She was weeping. She said, come sit down. I've been waiting on you to get home. I wanted to tell you about what happened tonight. I said, <laughs> I sat down on that bed. She said, Daddy came over tonight. We ate and we fellowshiped and we laughed and we talked and all this stuff and said, I could tell he's about to leave. And she said, Daddy turned around and his eyes was full of tears. And he said, Honey, as sure as I'm standing here, God woke me up this morning with a verse on my heart. And I, I feel led that I'm supposed to give you this verse. And I, I know you've been depressed. And I know you've been going through this darkness. And Daddy's been praying for you. And your family's been praying for you. And we're believing God for better days ahead. And I don't know what to do with it. All I know to do is tell you that God put a Bible verse on my heart to give to you. She said, what is it, Daddy? He whipped his Bible out of his back pocket and flipped it around and never looked down. He said, in all things, give thanks. For this is the will of God Amen. in Christ Jesus concerning you. I said, Becky, what happened? She said, I got so angry. She said, Daddy, are you telling me that not only has God taken my mama early, my mama will never get to meet her grandchildren. My mama has gone so early in her early 50s. And not only has God taken my mama, but now he's going to require me to thank him for taking my mama. Steve looked at her and said, no, honey, that's not what I'm saying. That's what I love about this verse. It's not saying for all things give thanks. It's saying in all things give thanks. Said, honey, all your life since you was a kid, you've been a worshiper and you've been a praiser. And the very thing that the devil has robbed you of in all of this is the source of your joy. And it's your worship and it's your praise. And honey, in the midst of this somehow and somewhere, you've got to get your praise back. And you've got to get that line open back between you and God. And Becky said she crossed her arms arms and said daddy I can't Steve looked at her and said I know God told me to say this to you I know God sent me here I'm going to get on my knees and if I got to pray for five minutes five hours or five days I'm not leaving here until we get victory in your life she said she stood there with her arms folded and arms crossed. Daddy got down on his knee beside the couch and got to call on the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Got to praise in God for the blood of Jesus and the power of Calvary and the redemption source of Jesus and got to giving God the glory in that room. And Becky said he prayed and prayed. And she said, I sat there with my arms crossed. Five minutes went by, ten minutes went by, and Brother Steve would not give up. He just kept out calling out on 
God, saying, God, my baby's wounded and my baby's in a dark place. Oh, God, please, would you give Becky some light tonight and give her some victory? And Becky said, I can't tell you when it happened. I can't exactly explain all of it. She said, but it was almost like you could hear the back door of the house open up and hear the flip-flops of Jesus coming in that little old house. And she said something I hadn't felt in a long time as as the presence of God wrapped its arms around me. And she said, I hadn't felt it in so long. But he began to love on me and hug on me and squeeze on me. Said, and he gave me the exact prayer to pray. Said, I got down on my knees beside daddy. She said, this is the prayer of praise that I prayed. God, thank you for 21 years with the best mama in the whole wide world. Instead of looking at what she lost, she started praising God for what she had. She said when she praised God for the 21 years of the best mama, she said it was like the Holy Ghost started showing her moments in it. And every time the Holy Ghost would show her a memory, she'd praise God for that memory. God, thank you for letting give me a mama that taught me how to sing. Thank you for a mama that raised me around the house of God. Thank you for a mama that taught me the Bible. Thank you for a mama that let me live in a house where mama loves daddy and daddy loves mama. And she said before I knew it, me and daddy was having camp meeting in the living room, praising God and thanking God for all of his goodness and all of his mercy and everything that God had done. She said, I'm afraid to go to sleep. She said, because I don't know what tomorrow will be like, but right now, she said, when I started praising, it's like the Holy Ghost started taking all that bitterness and all those chains that the devil had put on me. She was weeping and she was smiling. She said, CT, I'm free. We went to sleep that night, and Becky has never been the same. Amen. Two months later, we're at the health insurance office trying to get health insurance. They're asking all them nosy questions. I answer all my questions. They get to Becky, and I know the pregnant question is coming. And I know you don't ask that question to her because she'll start crying. Sure enough, he got, ma'am, is there any way you could possibly be pregnant? I said, no, sir, next question. (laughs) I'm trying to tell him, you don't know what you're going to mess with here. Just move on. (laughs) Ma'am, Mr. Townsend, I appreciate your help, but I really need to hear from Miss Becky. Miss Becky, is there any way that you could be pregnant? She went to crying. I said, there you go. He just waited to hear the answer. Well, Miss Townsend, is there any chance you could be pregnant? She looked at me, looked at him. She said, I think I am. (laughs) He said, should I give y'all a moment? I said, yeah. Yeah. He leaves. She, we got to talking. You know, back before she told me why she thought. And you know, I, I said, come on. I pulled her out of there. We went to Walmart. You know, they got them little blue and white things that you find out. I thought if one of them works good, 30 of them will work even better. I bought the whole shelf. We went to the house. I was throwing them things in the bathroom. She t- and we, we was lining them up, waiting that 15 minutes. You know, I read the back of it. The chances on the back, one in 99. Could be, you know, so I just thought I'm going to try it out. I'm going to put the odds in my favor. We lined them things one by one by one. And boy, they come out pregnant, 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 pregnant. Hey, I still didn't believe it. Finally, I went in there and took one myself. It said not pregnant. And I finally believed that thing. I ain't never getting invited back, but that's okay. Nine months later, June the 24th, 2010, Outside of my salvation, the best day of my life. (laughs) Little Tucker Townsend was born into this world. I had prayed for him before I ever met Becky. (laughs) That little thing come out. Everybody says, oh, them babies are so pretty. No, they ain't. (laughs) 
This one come out cone headed. They put a cap on him real quick. I thought we have done something bad wrong. Went through all the formalities and all the family finally left. And Becky's on that bed and she's got a little tucker. And <laughs> Big old tears went to run down her cheeks. And she said, do you realize what God did? I said, what? She said, all I did was pray for a baby and I couldn't have one. She said, and God was waiting on me to get my heart to a place where I could thank him in all things. And once her heart got in the right place, it's like the key went to the door. Could it be your prayers haven't been answered yet because you're still sticking your fist up at God. You're still mad. And I understand. It's okay to not be okay. It's not okay to stay that way. Tonight we serve a Savior that can set you free. Yes. Tonight we serve a Savior that although you are in a fire, you can walk around at peace and liberty. And then they got out of that fire, they got promoted, and their God became the God because of their testimony. Yes. Good. Only thing you need to do is you got to find Him. Yes. If you're in a fire, quit looking at the fire. Quit looking at the furnace and say, I know you in here somewhere. Where are you at? Jesus, I know you in here somewhere. You wouldn't let me in here by myself. Where are you at? And if you listen real carefully, he'll say, Psst, here I am. And you can walk around in the midst of the fire together. Every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody's looking around. They're about to sing a song of invitation. I don't know how you do things around here. I want us to stand to our feet. Here's what I believe. I believe as I walk, look around this room tonight while I'm preaching, there's people wiping tears out of your eyes. And God's dealing with your heart. Some of you got your hands raised. And God's, God's done something in your heart. Here's what I want you to do. If God dealt with your heart tonight, if God put his finger on an area of your life tonight, if you are in a fire and you need to find Jesus tonight, right now in the name of Jesus, as they begin to sing, I want you to get out of your seat right now. Come find a place around this altar and let's pray together. Come on, come on. That's right.